few verses in and so we're continuing as what I call you little beauty and um, so far we've seen that you know the king is not very happy with the situation he's come back from Greece with his tail between his legs he's not happy the palace is empty Vashti's not there she used to greet him and he is down in the dumps and then his advisors come up with a wonderful idea why not have a beauty contest? And so it pleased the king and he signed the documents and so they sent out to get all these um, young women and um, gathered them together. And so we're picking up here in verse 4 of chapter 2, the prospect. Then let the young girl who most pleases the king become queen in place of Vashti. The king liked the idea, so he did, as they said. Now, it's interesting. It's a Miss Persia beauty contest. 127 provinces, all the young, most beautiful virgin girls of the empire were to participate. This was not an invitation you could refuse. He didn't bother to ask the parents if it was okay they had just to come and he said he's um, advisors out to collect the young women and um, bring them into the contest now remember it's based purely on outward appearances nothing else the king was not concerned about your intellectual abilities he wasn't concerned about your physical abilities, about what you could do with your cook, eye, and all any of those things. Um, he wasn't concerned whether you had a PhD in rocket science. That's not what he cared about. You had to be a knockout, as far as he was concerned. That's all he was interested in. Nothing else. You had to be physically beautiful. You had to be young. You had to be a virgin. That's all you needed. You know what? Nothing else much has changed, if you like, in our world today. If you meet the criteria, doors are open to you. But you know, these things always have a cost involved. In our text, we see the weakness of Xerxes. He relied on the advice of others, they came up with a beauty contest and it was designed in such a way there's only one judge guess who that is it had to be the king and he would be the sole judge he would be the only one who could appoint the winner based upon a one night stand now if you think about it why wouldn't this bloke be happy he would have thought all his dreams had come true. It appealed to his ego. It appealed to his fantasies. Now a text says the proposal pleased the king. So once again, he was doing whatever he wanted to do. But this time, he was given license by his advisors to indulge himself in whatever he wanted or whatever he thought would make him a happy little chappy. Now think about it. You're the king. It's a beauty contest. And if Josephus is right, he recorded there was four young, 400 young, beautiful virgin women. Now, he thinks he's in heaven because he's the sole judge. And they get to spend one night with him and they had to sexually please him why wouldn't this appeal to your ego if you're a male so no wonder he was a happy man but there are no options available to these young women they became his possession for life after a one night stand if they were not made the queen they were destined to spend the rest of their life in his harem. They would be forgotten. There was no hope for them of a husband or a family. Though his property, pamphlet, 
and they had to be available at his beck and call. This was the prospect that each one of those young women faced. Only one of them would be successful. And so they were resigned to the fact that they would have to accept this is a way of life and this is what was going to be for them. But it also reveals a little bit more of Xerxes' character. He wasn't interested in family. He was only in, interested in indulging in his fancy, taking whatever he wanted just so he could keep up his appearances. So the prospect were not very good for the young ladies, but for the king, oh, he thought it was wonderful. So he's happy. He was doing what his advisors told him to do, and he was going to make hay while the sun shone. Then we have what I call the providential sovereignty in these verses. Now, in such circumstances, you could stop and ask yourself, where was God? in all of this. What was God doing? Why did he allow this event to be something that he could use? Why didn't he just stop it? He is, after all, God. He has the power. He can change people. He can change events. So why didn't he do this in the case of Esther? Why did he allow it to go through such a degrading process? But we understand God did use those circumstances to prepare and to provide for the protection of his people, even though they were under the tyrant Xerxes. And we can see God's handprints all over the circumstances of this account in Scripture. They were not coincidental events. They happened. And God took advantage of them to accomplish his plans and he used everyday events to accomplish it. So he took what was there. He used the people that were available to bring about his plans to protect his people. Now the providence, we find in verse 5, now there was a Jewish man in the palace of Susa whose name was Mordecai, son of Jair. Jair was the son of Shimei, the son of Kish. Mordecai was from the tribe of Benjamin. So we're given a little bit of his ancestry here, where he came from. Now, when I talk about providence, what do I mean by providence? It's a word we use, but what does it actually mean? Does anyone know? Well, it could say provision, but the dictionary definition says providence is an influence that is not human in origin and is thought to control people's lives. And that's how they define providence. But you know what? The actual word providence is not found in the Bible, not in the scriptures. But we have references that provide the idea of providence such as God's way, God's ordinance, God's hand, upholding, working, government, care, deeds, all of these are legitimate substitute, substitutes for the word providence. Now, there's two words that often overlap. One is God's providence and the other is God's sovereignty. Are they one and the same, or are they different? God's sovereignty, God's providence. They are slightly different, but they often will overlap in what they do. God's sovereignty is his right and power to do whatever he wants. That's God's sovereignty. When he decides to do a thing, he does it. And there's no power on earth can stop him from doing it. That's sovereignty. God will accomplish all he intends to do. As one old church father said, 
Nothing therefore happens unless God wills it to happen. He either permits it to happen or he brings about it himself. So what that, does that mean? It means that nothing in your life and my life is so small or trivial as to escape the attention of his sovereign control. And nothing is so great as to be beyond his power to control it. So as we think about that, we sense his providence in that statement. In other words, the one whose eye is on the sparrow cares enough for me. He watches, he cares, he has a purpose, he has a plan. And so that is involved in his sovereignty. Now when we look at our text, we might be thinking, oh, it was lucky it was by chance that Mordecai happened to be in the right place at the right time for all these events as they happen. Isn't that coincidence? Just right, lucky, in the right place, doing the right thing. Yeah, what are the chances? But that's how people would view it. Lucky to be there, meaning all by random choice and events. And they would say, that's all there is. There's nothing more to see here. A bit like our politicians, the sleight of hands. Nothing to see here. It's all legitimate. Trust me. But we know that there's a lot more going on here. If we understand that the Jews had been carried away into captivity many years before this event happened, and yet we see God's hand was preparing for this exact time in history. There's no coincidence about it. He was preparing well before this time. And as someone said, it just so happened that Mordecai, who was Esther's cousin and uncle, who adopted her into his family, just happened to have a high position of influence in the palace of Shushan and would be able to enable Esther to become queen. It just happened that way. This wasn't something that happened by chance. It wasn't something that happened by accident. It was due to God's hand who was working all things out, pulling the strings, if you like, to accomplish what was happening. And he was imposing his will upon all the characters in this account in Esther. So it wasn't a chance, it wasn't just lucky. God was working all those little pieces together. You know, I still find it frustrating when you get one of these big, you know, five or 10,000 puzzle, um, jigsaw puzzles, and someone tips it out and says, put it together. They all look the same. And you've got to get little pieces and you put them together and you work this out and you think, oh, I've got this one goes in here, this one goes in here, that one goes there, but, you know, it looks exactly the same. And you scratch your head and you're thinking, how am I supposed to work this out? Well, God was working and moving the pieces into place so that the picture could be complete. And that's what he does. Mordecai had been put in such a position for such a time as this. He would be the instrument that God would choose to put Esther in that position of queen. There was nothing by chance. God was moving the pieces into place. And as we look at our day and we look at the times, people are saying, well, what's going to happen? Well, I believe God's moving all the pieces into the right position, just as he said he would thousands of years ago. And we're seeing those pieces. We're catching a glimpse of the picture of what is to come. Now, we haven't seen all the pieces, but, you know, there's enough of them being moved in position for us to know that something is happening. And it's not by chance. It's not by accident. God is moving nations and people into places just as he said he would. We see, whoops, the preservation in verse 6. 
which had been taken captive from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. They were part of the group taken into captivity with Jehoiachin, king, king of Judah. Now what? Big mobs, you would say. Big mobs. There was three. In 605 BC, now I wasn't there so I can't clarify it for you, but it's in the history books. 597 BC and 586 BC, there were three of these captivities of the Jewish people. Now our text is not saying that this was Mordecai because if it's referring to Mordecai, how old would he be by now? He'd be an old man. He'd be at least 110 to 120 years of age. So it's not referring to Mordecai himself. It's referring to Mordecai's great-grandfather Kish, a Benjaminite who was taken into exile in Babylon. How then does this equate to Mordecai, the great-grandson, ending up in the capital city of Susa, 120 miles east of Babylon, and being serving in the palace? Well, what we're told in Scripture, according to 1 Chronicles 3.16, Jehoiachin was the second to last king of Judah. He was deported to Babylon in 597 BC, 114 years before the present events that are happening in our text. So it can't be referring to Mordecai. Mordecai's family had been held in captivity by the Babylonians years earlier, and now they're under the Persian control because they conquered the Babylonians. So we still have the Jewish people under a Gentile ruler of the Persians. Now, I have no doubts that many of God's people wondered at this time if God had completely abandoned them because, hey, their situation had changed. They were still captives. But the truth was God was preserving them and even though they were under a Gentile ruler they were prospering even though things were difficult. God still preserved them and they were prospering. And that's a reminder to us as believers we're held safely in God's hands. We are eternally secure and the scriptures tell us absolutely nothing can remove us from his hands. Once we're in God's hands, we stay there. We don't jump out, and no man can take them out of my Father's hands. That's the promise. And even though we might suffer physically at the hands of others, we're reminded God's love, there's nothing separates us from God's love for us. Absolutely nothing. That never changes even though we might suffer for a little while physically. We see the preparation in verse 7. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah who had no father or mother, so Mordecai took her care of her. Hadassah was also called Esther. She had a very pretty figure and face. Mordecai had adopted her as his own daughter when her mother and father died. So Hadassah is Esther's Hebrew name and it means myrtle. Her Persian name means star after the pagan god Ishtar. So that gives us a little bit of background. Now when Mordecai learned of the search for a queen, he brought Esther to the palace to be processed by Hegai, the keeper of women. Her father and mother had died. Mordecai had raised her as his own daughter. So this wasn't coincidence. It wasn't a random stroke of luck that it just happened. God had placed Esther within the home of Mordecai to prepare her for such a time as they're about to enter. Now no doubt his position within the palace, God pulled the strings for it to happen. God had prepared them for the work he had for them. As one commentator said, 
There's a beautiful message here for anyone who has ever experienced brokenness, for anyone who has ever been crushed by life, for anyone who has ever felt that his past is so discolored, so disjointed, so fractured, that there's no way in the world God can make reason and meaning out of it. It's an encouragement. He prepared this little orphan girl. I have no doubts who cried a howl heart out of the death of her parents. She's left, bereft, and orphaned. Yet years later, she would become key to the very survival of a people, the Jewish people. Now God, and God alone, can do such things. In fact, he continues to such things while working silently and invisibly behind the events of history. God is at work. Now God's plans are not hindered when the events of this world are carnal or secular. His presence penetrates even the godless banquet halls of ancient Persia. So if he can do that, he's not limited to getting into our homes and into the societies and places where we work and the people that we meet. God is not restricted. He's just as much as someone has said at work in the Oval Office, as he is in the pastor's study. He's as much at work in other countries of the world, like Iran or China or the Middle East, just as he has, he is here in Australia at this present time. He just doesn't centre his work around one country. He's working throughout all the countries of the world. Now, that means... God's in control. What does that mean to you and I as Christians? God's in control. God sits on the throne. So that no matter what happens here, no matter what happens over in Ukraine, or Russia, or China, or Taiwan, should we be concerned? Should we find and put ourselves in the bunkers? and bunker down for possible World War III? Or do we know that God's got this? You see, God's at work throughout the whole world. And he's involved. But often he will take us outside our comfort zones. And as people, we don't like to be taken out of our comfort zones too often. We don't want things to stay the way they are nice and secure but you know what God wants us where we are he wants us to be salt and light wherever we are we do make a difference in the world this world could be a lot worse if it wasn't for the influence of Christians who are living their lives for the Lord and that's something we need to consider carnal and unfair it doesn't mean that he's not present the things that are happening in our society may not be honouring him, may not be glorifying him. But never doubt, God is here in our society, in our community, in our world today. He's not dead. He is here with us. And as the scripture said, his hand is not so short it cannot save, nor is his ear so heavy that he cannot hear. Whether you see him or not, he's at work in your life this very moment. And the other thing is, God doesn't have to do something dramatic in our lives. He takes the ordinary, everyday humbug, if you like, the grind that we do every day, and makes it meaningful. He gets involved in our lives, often in unusual ways. But he also moves on uneventful days. But he's just as involved in our everyday normal life as he is in something big and spectacular because he cares. He has the purposes and plans and he's working that out. There's, whoops. A personal separation in verses 8 and 9. I often thought, what a terrifying prospect for someone like Esther to be taken away from all her friends, all her family, 
and housed within a palace, cut off from any normal interactions with anybody she knew. Because that's what was involved. These young ladies were collected, taken to the palace and cut off from their friends and families and their neighbours. There was no one to provide her with comfort and security. She was on her own. No one there to give her advice. She was on her own and had to trust in a God who had been silent for so long. Think about the circumstances. She's on her own. And oftentimes in difficulties through life, we find that we're on our own. Who do we turn to? Where do we turn to? Now we look at the palace in verse 8. When the king's command and order had been heard, many girls had been brought into the palace in Susa. Now our text makes it plain this is a beauty contest. It was the command of a king. It wasn't like this is an optional lecture, will I or won't I? You couldn't refuse if you wanted to. You had to accept the invitation. And particularly when we know the history of Xerxes, he was given to temper tantrums if he didn't get his own way. He chucked a wobbly. And nobody wanted that. Everybody knew his temper tantrums. So it was a command. You complied. If you didn't, you died. End of story. Now it's hard for us as modern day people to understand or accept this concept. But you know what? We're not looking at this account through a modern day lens. We cannot ignore or we cannot deny what has happened in history. And the Bible plainly states that this is what happened. Like it or not, this is what occurred. So we can debate, we can argue, but it's not going to change what happened. It happened. Esther and all the girls were gathered together and brought into the palace, placed under the watchful eye of Hegai, the keeper of the king's women and in charge of the harem. They had been brought from everywhere over the kingdom. And I think as they walked through the palace, it would have been a shock to many of them to see their opulence and wealth. This was like nothing they'd ever seen before. Not in their homes, and yet here they're walking in a palace where everything was laid on so it would have taken their breath away and they were brought to the palace for 12 months of intensive cosmetic and beauty preparations for one reason to be selected by the king 12 months now some people have wondered did Esther willingly submit herself to this pagan ritual or whether Mordecai gave his approval to participate in such an event Let's remind ourselves. The text says the king's command. This was at the king's command, which lets us know it wasn't a question of choice or options. Esther was beautiful and would be a prime candidate as a contestant. She had no say in the matter. The scriptures make it plain that a young Jewish woman cannot marry a pagan. In other words, an uncircumcised Gentile man. That's according to Deuteronomy 7. You can look that up yourself. That was according to law. Nor were they allowed to have a sexual relationship with a man who was not a husband, according to Exodus 20. Neither was she allowed to eat unclean food, according to Leviticus 11. And yet it seems Esther did all of these things. People say, how gross, how unbecoming for someone of Esther's status as a young Jewish woman that she would enjoy such a prospect of breaking the law to become the wife of someone like Xerxes who had a legendary reputation as a womanizer. Charles Spurgeon says, we cannot commend Mordecai for putting his adopted daughter in a competition for the monarch's choice. It was contrary to the law of God and dangerous to her soul in the highest degree. As someone said, it would have been better for Esther to have been the wife of a poorest man and the house of Israel 
that have gone into the den of this Persian despot. Now the scripture does not excuse, much less commend the wrongdoing of Esther and Mordecai in doing this. It simply tells us how God brought good out of this situation. That's all it tells us. It doesn't deal with the morals or the principles or anything else. It tells us how God used this situation with these people to make good out of something that was wrong, that was bad. The, pro oh, the procurement. Esther was taken, also taken to the king's palace, put under the care of Haggai, who was in charge of the women. Now, in some respects, I feel sorry for this keeper of women, Haggai. Can you imagine what it was like to cater for 400 young women? Think about it. 400 young women from all different backgrounds, from all different personalities, and he has to keep them happy. Do you know how hard it is to keep a whole group of women happy for very long? He's got to do this for 12 months. So feel sorry for the guy for just a little moment. I mean, he's the job. He's got it. And that was his task, to keep these women happy. He had to make sure they were up to scratch, that the king would take delight in them. Otherwise, He's lost his head. So it's a big task that he's asked. To organise and keep happy 400 frightened and demanding young women for 12 months. So he had to be organised and he had to have people skills to accomplish his task. And I wouldn't be, want to be in that position because all of these women have one option, to be the very best they can so one of them can be chosen, and yet there's 400 of them. So you can imagine the competition. You can imagine keeping them all happy. And then we see, as we finish, the preference. Esther pleased Heggy, and he liked her. So Heggy quickly began giving Esther her beauty treatments and special food. He gave her seven servant girls chosen from the king's palace. Then he moved her and her seven servant girls to the best part of the women's quarter. Now we're told that Esther pleased this royal keeper of women. She won his favour. How did she do that? Now remember, she couldn't use any sexual favours to gain an advantage because he was a eunuch. So there was no sexual favours involved with this man. How did she get preferential treatment? And I want us to think about this. You're the keeper of all these women, 400 of them. They're all making their demands. Which woman would stand out to you that you would enjoy doing things for? If you had 400, what sort of a young lady would stand out for you? One that causes you less problems, wouldn't it? That makes your job easy? Well, I believe that this is exactly how Esther got preferential treatment because she didn't need makeup. She was beautiful. She didn't need all the cosmetics treatment that was available and so it made his job easy there's no more demands I need this I need this I need that I want this I want that oh what a delight to have somebody that's not demanding someone who is natural she looked good no matter what she wore and she made his job easier so he provided her according to the text with everything she needed in the harem to succeed. And if we go ahead to verse 15, it wasn't just him that she made an impression upon. 
She made an impression on everyone who encountered her because, you know, on the outside she looked good but it was her character, her kindness, her graciousness. She exhibited that to everybody that she met and so everybody was impressed. Everyone favoured her because of her personality and who she was. So it was an asset. Now remember, she, she wasn't there by choice. She was drafted. They were gathered under the direction of the royal edict. These women weren't allowed to marry if they didn't win the contest. They would join the king's harem. On the surface, this might seem like something that you didn't want to be part of. But you know what? 99% of these ladies wouldn't have the joy of having their own families or freedom. And if you think about it, life in a harem. Really, is that what you want as a young lady? You know, one night with the king and then you're off to the boondocks, you can't do anything. There would have been plenty of reasons to be bitter, plenty of reasons to be depressed and discouraged. And yet, Esther never showed that at all. She was gracious, no matter what the circumstances. Now, upon arriving at the palace, Esther immediately received everything she needed to have a successful campaign for the Queen of Persia. This was not limited to Esther, but we do discover she was provided with an abundance at the palace. We could say, the beauty contest's over, because others didn't know it. But God had already appointed Esther to serve as queen. He would see to it that she gained this position. Others didn't know that. Esther didn't know that. But God already had appointed and designed for her to be that way. But because of her character, she had an influence upon everybody that she met. She wasn't bitter or twisted about poor me, woe is me, look what's happened to me, my parents have died. I'm t taken away from my uncle and everybody I knew and here I am to pleasure the king for one night and I, that I might or might not be the queen. That would get you down. But we're told it didn't with Esther. God already knows how our lives are going to unfold. Now I've often said sometimes I like a crystal ball just to have a look and see what's around the corner. You know, just a little bit around the corner. And then I thought, no, I don't want to know what's around the corner because I'm not prepared for it. But God knows what's around the corner tomorrow, the next day, and the future. He's behind the scenes orchestrating our lives according to his divine purpose and plan. He has chosen us for himself according to his purposes and he'll see to it that his plans are fulfilled. Now I did do up the next part, but we're past time already, so you're going to have to come back for the second